hello to everyone. This is a nine run center web meeting like the ones we have on Saturdays with Josh, who is a positive psychologist and he's also running uh, Resurface UK. Actually, Josh, maybe it's a good idea to introduce yourself because you're going to do a better job. So every Saturday we have Josh who brings his expertise in psychology to shed light to some of the issues that worry us these days or some advice to make our life better. And I have to say I have it has really helped me. So I'm really looking forward to today's topic. Today's is about productivity. Without any further delay, let's go to Josh. Okay, thank you. Um, and good evening to everyone. Good to see you all here. Beautiful day. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking today about productivity in the context of flow. So what Nikos was sort of taught, some of you were uh, uh, here a little bit, you know, five, ten minutes ago, Nikos was talking about he started reading the book Flow and since he started or listening to it, his productivity this week improved on a couple of days. And I'm just going to give a real quick recap of what Flow is. Flow is, a, is an optimal state of consciousness where you feel your best, you perform at your best. Um, some of the symptoms of Flow is a time dilation, um, total focus on task at hand, feeling, it to feeling totally at one with what you're doing. It's what we call effortless effort. Um, and a lot of people can relate to flow states in childhood and a lot of people are missing them in adulthood, but it's, it's the ultimate form of productivity. When you're in flow, learning accelerates about 500%. Um, Creativity about 400%. If, if you want to look at some of these studies, the McKinsey study on productivity is probably one of the best things around flow. But what I want to do is I want to show you and go through the flow cycle very quickly um, and then get down to how you can get yourself a bit more productive in the day. Um, just a certain tools that, are, that make a, a huge, huge difference. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to share with you the flow cycle. And it starts off in the struggle phase. The struggle phase of, of any flow state tends to last for about 15 minutes, roughly, 10 to 20 minutes, but 15 minutes. A lot of people um, relate to this when, if, when I say, if you go running, a lot of people will report, and myself included, the first sort of 10, 15 minutes there's a bit of a conversation in the head going on about like, do I really want to be doing this? Um, this is this is too much effort. You know, is there anything else I can do, etc. So, knowing that there's a struggle phase and it lasts a limited amount of time, and if you can push through the struggle phase, you'll get into release and then into flow. It's probably one of the the most important building blocks of of becoming more productive is knowing that you will have this struggle phase. And that's the, the time when maybe you're procrastinating or you're just sort of like, you're trying to get everything in order, but you really can't be bothered to start or you're afraid of starting, etc. But if you know that there always has to be a struggle phase for you to burst into flow, then you can embrace the struggle. And one of the best uh, tools for becoming more comfortable with struggle phase is uh, developing your mindfulness skills, learning to accept what is in the moment and that you are going through a bit of a struggle, then that's absolutely makes everything much, much easier. Then once you push through the struggle phase, you get into the release phase. And when you hit the release phase, a lot of nitric oxide is released in the body that allows for greater oxygen consumption, which allows for greater productivity. Um, think about like if you're doing some kind of exercise, etc. You need you need a lot more oxygen to keep burning at that high rate. Also, your brainwave state changes. Uh, you go from the beta to alpha. Alpha brainwave state is most the probably you could relate to that the best of when you're kind of the first half an hour of the morning when you get up. You're awake, but you're in a slightly different state to when you're in that sort of. Um, 
you know, day to like, further on in the day, just getting on with everything kind of state, you know, you're, you're slightly, you just, you are in a slightly different zone. You go through the release phase and then you get into flow. And when you get into flow, as I said, it, um, learning accelerates. You're in full focus at the task in hand. And when, when you're in flow, it's what we describe as effortless effort. Everything kind of makes sense. You can just do what you need to do. If you're writing, the words are just writing themselves in many ways. If you're playing football and, you're, um, and so on, it's just like you, all your passing's coming together. If you're singing or playing in a band, everything is just, you're, you know, there's many different words for being in flow, different cultures. So um, jazz musicians talk about being in the pocket and sportsmen talk about being in the zone and so on. But, this is the most productive state you can be in. And so we want to be able to engender it and we want to be able to, uh, what you, one of the criteria, most important criteria for being a flow is, is, is full focus. So you don't want to be interrupted here. So if you hold that in mind to do with productivity, you, you want to have like, if your work, if your productivity is based around being in the office and so on, you don't want to be interrupted by colleagues. You don't want to be interrupted by your phone. You need to be completely at one with the task. And then when you come out of the flow state, because you can only be in flow for a certain amount of time, kind of two hours maximum. So this is why we often block book two, two to three hour sessions to be able to really focus and get down to it because uh it, it uses up a tremendous amount of energy and you need to replace the glucose because the brain uses up so much glucose and so on and then you come into the recovery phase and again it's the recovery phase and the struggle phase that require the most attention you really want to um be aware of the recovery phase and you want to utilize certain tasks and tools to really um not soften the landing, but just pad it out so that you can really go through the recovery phase. Because if you want to get back into flow, you have to, you have to go through all these phases. So you have to go through recovery phase and then back into the struggle phase. And I'll give you some concrete examples in a sec, but when you're in the recovery phase, you're having more Delta brainwave states and that allows for um, a lot of connections to be made in, in the mind. So it's often in the recovery phase that you have what we call the, re the eureka moments. You know, Nietzsche said that uh, the best ideas come after a long walk. And what he's talking about is actually you, when you go on, often you go on a long sort of hike, because he's talking about hiking, which involves a certain amount of challenge to the walk. You often find you get into kind of mild to medium flow states walking. And then when you come back, often the, the good ideas pop in. And my own experience is that a lot of my best ideas come during the recovery phase. But during recovery phase, you're not necessarily particularly productive, but certain ideas come to mind. So certain things to do if you're, if you, you know, you've been fully in focus at work and then you, you, you're coming out, you, you notice when you're coming out of flow because you're starting to have to sort of think about things a bit more. You're having to like the energy levels, it becomes a little bit more, instead of being effortless effort, it's starting to become effort. And you, you find yourself dropping out of that sort of total focus. And that's okay. And as long as you can recognize that, it's like, okay, I'm going to recovery phase now. When you go into the recovery phase, that's the time to have some snacks, if it's that time of the day, to drink some water, um, maybe do a little bit of journaling. Definitely do, maybe it's the perfect time to do some meditation. And it's often during meditation that the ideas pop in and we say they pop in. They don't actually just pop in. They're actually the result of a huge amount of work that's been going on consciously and unconsciously when you're in the flow state, etc. So that's the flow state. And as I was saying, the flow cycle, sorry. And, and we really want to get into flow as much as we can if we want to be super productive. So there's certain things that we have to be aware of. We have to be aware and keep repeating this, that there will always be a struggle. If there's no struggle, you're not going to get into flow. And I'm going to share, share with you a different screenshot. So this is the, uh, what we call the skills challenge balance. 
you can only get into flow when your challenge meets your ability, when the, the challenge meets your ability. So for example, I often use this example to, to illustrate this or to concretize it. If I want to get into flow playing football, um, and I haven't played football for a long time, I need to be playing with people who are of my ability or just a tiny bit, bit, tiny bit higher in ability. And, that, and if that's true, the challenge, which you can see going up the uh, y-axis and the, um, meets my, the abilities, I'll get into flow. If I'm playing with people who, uh, let's say I suddenly find myself on the football pitch in a Premier League game, I am uh, going to be right up here in anxiety, stressed, alert. I'll probably have a panic attack because my abilities do not match the high challenge. So you need um, to get into flow. You, your ability needs to be able to meet the challenge. And this is something that's essential for learning how to be productive. If you're setting the goals and you're setting the challenge too high, you won't be able to get into flow. You'll be highly unproductive. You'll just be stuck in anxiety. Now, if the goal isn't high enough, at best, let's say I'm playing football with, and I use this example with, with Christina's young nephews, at best, I'll be relaxed. They're, they're six, and six years old. Yeah. So at best, it'll be relaxing playing with football. It might be a little bit boring because my ability is much far exceeds the challenge of playing at that level. So you need to, to, be, to be able to get into flow, you really need to um, have your challenge, it's called the challenge skills balance, totally locked in. So if you wanna be really productive, maybe you've got to write your thesis, or you've got to come up with a, 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 um, a business plan or whatever it is, you need to make sure that you're the ch that it's challenging enough and that your ability meets that. And if you don't have that, you're never going to get into flow. So you might notice this, that the, the challenge skills balance, um, you might notice this when, let's say, for example, uh, you go bouldering or rock climbing for the very first time. You probably won't have the skills to meet some of the hard stuff, but you'll find it deeply satisfying and you could probably find yourself in full focus and getting into flow on the really easy parts of the climbing wall because you don't have those skills yet. So actually it's still a high challenge for you. And then as you progress and you, and you get better and better at your climbing skills, you, you up the challenge and you go from, I don't know what it is, like a red route to a blue route or whatever it is that you you know, these different markings on the wall, etc. You always need to be pushing yourself so that you're always at kind of your maximum capacity. And you need to take that principle into any kind of productive work you're doing. So if you want to get into flow uh, playing the piano, you need to be doing something that's going to push you, not something that's really easy. At the best, it'll be relaxing. But if it's a piece that's just at the, peak, at the top of your um, ability range, then you're likely to be able to get into flow because flow follows focus and when something is of a high challenge you it focuses the mind much better than something that's of a low challenge so if you are you you need to be really productive with some of your work this week you need to engender and change and, and make sure the environment challenges you enough to get into that full focus and one of the ways of doing that, and this is what Nikos was talking about earlier, is, is to actually to give yourself a bit of a time frame to challenge yourself that, okay, I mean, some of you may have heard of um, Parkinson's law. The work expands the, to fill, hold on, maybe, fill the time available for its completion. So if you have a task that's going to take you half an hour and you want to be really productive, make sure that you create in your diary a half an hour time frame to do that half an hour task. And that will push you to do it and it'll fully focus the mind and then you'll be super productive. I, you know, I, I found for a long time that you know, if I've got all day to write a letter or I've got all weekend to do a simple task, it'll take all that time to do it because you'll leave it to the last minute or, 
And so or you'll, I, I, I'm not going to talk for you. I will find that sometimes I will uh, do half of it and then leave it for a bit and come back to it, etc. And it will take up the time allotted. So it might take the whole weekend, etc. So if you want to be really productive, you need to limit your time on tasks so that you are pushed. So that you can, uh, what you're doing is you're upping the challenge of a task. And by doing that, it creates the focus that enables you to get into the flow state. So, you know, what we really want to be is we want to be here as much as possible. So many of us right now have probably have a lot of capacity to not be interrupted. Some of you will not have that. Some of you probably might be locked down in families it's with families, etc. require attention. But if you don't, there is an opportunity right now to really build up um, a couple of ways of, uh, not a couple of ways, a way of building up a, a structure in the day that will enable you to be super productive. And uh, this, this would be an example of, of, of how to, this is how you might coach a CEO or someone who, who needs to do something really important. And that you can extrapolate from this into your own life and day. The night before you've got to do your important task, that's where preparation is essential. So you need to have really clear goals about what is it you want to do the next day. What is the goal? What is the task? And really break that down and break it down into micro goals if necessary. So it's not, it's, it's not good enough to say, I need to write, I need to start my dissertation. What you need to do is you need to say, I need to start and have the introduction done by X amount of time. And if you find that you're procrastinating, the more detail you go into about what the goals are and the content of that goals, the easier it is to break the procrastination and start. So the night before you want to have really clear goals about what it is you're going to do the next day. Then make sure you have good calendar skills and block book the time out to do those tasks. And I would suggest that you get up early. You're, you're planning to get up early. So maybe you block book the first time of being able to get into flow from, I don't know, seven till nine in the morning. And what you would do the night before is one of the most essential parts of productivity is reducing cognitive load. You want to make it as easy for yourself as possible to fully focus on that task and not have any other kind of interruption, including interruptions into your thinking. So make sure that you have, you've set things up like, so your phone is on silent and, and all these kind of things. And you've got a, a you've got a clean, crisp environment to do your work in with very little distraction that you set up your desk or your computer, etc., So it's ready to go first thing in the morning. You've got your glass of water there. You've got your notepad next to the computer and that's it. And you've got your environment perfect for working with no distraction. Some people will say, put your clothes out the night before so that as soon as you get up, you just know exactly what you're wearing. You're not wasting any cognitive energy or cognitive load on even thinking about what you're going to be wearing. You have all that plan the night before. And one of the reasons to do this the night before is that, that for most people, the night before, you're not particularly productive. It's often quite hard to think in the evenings, but you can use that time to put out your clothes, you know, things that aren't going to tax your mind too much, but you can use that time pr productively to prepare for the next morning. Now, this is quite a good little flow hack, particularly for writers, but for anyone who wants to to get on with your work. When you wake up in the morning, you, you tend to be in a closest to an alpha brainwave state. So what you've done is in many ways, if you think about the flow cycle is you've almost skipped out the struggle phase. When you wake up, you're almost, you're basically in a brain alpha brainwave state. So use that to avoid the struggle phase. So in many ways you want to be working within about 90 seconds to two minutes of waking up. So if you can get up, some of you might need to make a cup of coffee or something, but you get up and you get dressed straight away and you get straight to work, you've almost missed out the struggle phase. And then you can get into the flow state really quickly. 
and then you do your two two hours of solid productive work and this is one of the reasons why so many ceos etc get up really early the reason they get up really early is because you're very unlikely to be interrupted at that time and this that's the one of the key most key aspects of being in flow and being super productive is not being interrupted allowing that full focus of, of to be just at one with the work that you're doing then when you come out of the flow state and you start to tire and you start to notice that things are slowing down a bit and it's you're not at you know peak you're not in peak performance anymore ah i'm in the recovery phase this is the perfect time to have my breakfast to do my stretches to, and then do some of the positive psychology exercises that are often recommended. For example, doing your gratitude lists, your blessings journal, savoring some positive memories, maybe doing a little bit of mindfulness there, but eating well, taking care of yourself. If, if any of you have the luxury of being able to have like an infrared sauna or any of these kind of things that aid recovery, and you've eaten, you've replenished your energy, you're ready to come back into the struggle phase. Be very aware that the struggle phase is probably going to be 15, 20 minutes, that you're not going to be where you were a few hours ago and flow. But as long as you're aware of that and you know that, you can push through the struggle phase. Then you go through release and bang, boom, you're back in flow again. Two more hours of flow. Your productivity is at 500% to normal work. By the time you get here, it's lunchtime. Maybe even a little bit earlier when you're back in another recovery phase. Once you hit the recovery phase for the second time, you want to be super productive. Yeah, you're probably quite tired in some many ways, but by this stage, this is the time you have your lunch. This is the time to start checking your emails, starting to do all those things that would normally interrupt you during the day. Check your Facebook if you need to, check Twitter, check the news, etc. Then you can spend the rest of the day doing your exercise. If you work out, you can um, go do your yoga class. You can do all that delegation that you need to do that's often a bit hectic. Um, responding and to all your emails all those kind of things which are essential and you need to do but you've done that after you've done maybe two if hopefully flow states that you've been in where you've been super productive and that allows and you have to be really like you have to you have to implement certain things for that morning super productive phase you need to do things like I was talking about either last week or the week before. Like I have now got rid of all notifications on my phone. And the reason that I've got rid of all notifications on my phone is that I can't use the phone to distract me from the struggle phase. So if I want to look in my WhatsApp or I want to look on Instagram or I want to check my emails or anything, I have to make the conscious choice to go into that, into my phone because sometimes what really eats into productivity and a lot of research from McKinsey and other places has shown that we often get interrupted by either notifications or emails or other people, et cetera. If we're kind of working in an open plan office or we haven't set up our environment to be conducive to productivity, quite often we're interrupted about six times an hour on average and six, and it takes on average about five minutes to get back into the task. So that's half an hour out of every hour that's often interrupted by distraction. And some of that distraction is you go onto your phone to check the email and there's a notification from another app and you get distracted by that. Oh, I'll just check my WhatsApp and you see a message and then you start responding to that and then you've lost your train of thought and then your cognitive load has gone down and, and then it all just becomes too jumbled and you're using up a huge amount of energy to refocus. But if you can have it that you're just not interrupted, even by your phone, that you have that, you have that power to go in and, and check when you really want to check, it makes a huge difference. So, you know, as I've said this before, but on my phone now, if I touch the screen, all I get is the clock. I don't get a bunch of notifications that then totally ruin my concentration. 
other things to be really to be aware of when you're trying to be productive is you really need to unitask. So you, like I was saying, you have your clear goals the night before about what you want to do. And then you need to put them, the tasks within that in order. And you need to put all your focus and attention on getting the first task done. And then once that's done, you move on to the next one, then you move on to the next one. Because when you jump around tasks, you get a lot of what's called cognitive residue. And that reduces your productivity and reduces your capacity to focus. And we really, what we really want to be is we really want to be in flow. And when we're in flow, as I keep saying, we are up to 500% more productive. So if you think about it, that, that's the place you want to be if you want to be productive. You want to be at 500% above the normal. The, one of the other things is to be really aware of, and I, forgive me if I said this again recently, it's when you're in the struggle phase, it's the struggle phase where you're most often likely to reach out to get a little dopamine hit off your phone. I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I really don't want to do this, I know I've got to start, I'm not, oh, I'll just check Instagram. And you get that little dopamine hit, and I, it reduces the stress of the struggle phase, but all that does is it resets you to zero. So you can end up just finding yourself in a whole day's worth of struggle phase, because you keep, you keep interrupting the ability to get out of struggle into, and into release in the flow cycle. So you, that's one of the most essential reasons why we want to get rid of any ways of being distracted in, within the struggle phase. And this is why mindful, mindfulness techniques are so important and so helpful there, because they, mindfulness, even though mindfulness is technically just having non-judgmental um, attention in the moment, what one of the byproducts of that is it allows you and teaches you how to sit with struggle, how to sit with anxiety. And once, and if you allow yourself to sit with the anxiety, you can then move through it instead of keeping trying to self medicate the anxiety with little dopamine hits and distractions, you allow yourself to be in the struggle and then what, what you will learn is that the struggle phase doesn't last as long as you fear and then you go into release and then you go into flow. So that's, that's something to really to be aware of that when you're trying to be productive is that and I said this right at the beginning, you will need to go through the struggle. So you may as well develop techniques and things to make the struggle phase as easy as possible because you struggle, the struggle, the cortisol, the nor norepinephrine that's released in the struggle phase generates focus and it's the focus that total focus on task at hand that allows you get in, get into flow and remain in flow so block book in your diary certain times that you're going to really focus and work on the challenge at hand and block book it for say two or three hours put that in your diary and what you're doing when you're block booking is you are helping yourself avoid falling into this trap, knowing that you've only got till lunchtime to do X, Y, and Z, or you've got till nine o'clock to do X, Y, and Z. That focusing of the mind enables you to actually to be productive. So we want to be, we want to be eliminating as much cognitive load as possible. We want to be having, we want to be, have our clear goals in place when we, when we start working. We want to have an, an environment where we're not going to be interrupted and we want to be able to learn how to work through the struggle phase so that we can then get into flow. Now, something I want to say about flows is that they believe evolutionary that flow first sort of really came from runners high, that, that the people who were able to, to master that runners high were able to because I know, I mean, I don't know if many of you know this, and obviously a lot of evolutionary psychology and stuff is conjecture because we can't really actually know because we weren't there. But I do know for a fact that humans are the the as a predator, we're the the species that can outrun any other animal, and so we're not particularly fast. But I know that when hunting, 
what humans could do is they when they work together they could hunt down animals because they could out touch they could just keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going and until the, the the prey was exhausted and there's an evolutionary advantage of being able to get into that state that runner's high state that certain chemicals because when you are in flow there is flow feels so good that's one of the things about it when you're totally at one in, in, in the zone, not only have you got theta and, theta and gamma waves firing away, which are really cool, you've got dopamine. Dopamine is being released. Dopamine allows you to see connections. So you, you start, things make much more sense when you've got dopamine flooding, flooding the, uh, the brain. You've got uh, all those runners high, endorphins, et cetera, that just feel really good. And you've also got... Uh, this chemical, this hormone, this chemical called anandamide. And anandamide is the closest uh, sort of internal chemical to THC, which is in weed, you know, and cannabis. But what it does is it makes things a little sparklier, a little bit, when you're in flow, everything is a little bit shinier. Your, your senses are a little bit more heightened. Your hearing is a bit better. Your, your sight is a bit better. And this is partly due to all these things coming together. This feels great. We're able to really, really, really get into what we're doing. And this is why there's the accelerated learning, etc. But because of that, and I was talking about the evolutionary advantage, we're able to, we're able to outrun, our, uh, outrun the prey, etc. We, we could keep going with this, and we can keep going with this, and we can keep going with this until we tire. Um, that is where the magic happens. That's where so much of you just being able to get stuff done happens because when you're being super productive, it feels so good. And that makes sense. You know, that, that something that is of, of such high value to you and you're doing the work that is of high value to you, it would feel really good. So there, there we are. You're trying to get into flow. You're block booking in your calendar the two, three hours to, for you to be most productive. I mentioned this a, a week or two ago that you will need to take breaks sometimes when you're in flow. What you don't want to do is do anything that's more complex or gonna distract you from the task at hand. So usually the break that you do at the end, maybe at the end of the first hour and the end of the second hour, etc., is literally just having a glass of water, doing a stretch, maybe doing a couple of breathing exercises because what you don't want to do is you don't want to distract yourself and pull yourself away from the task at hand. So be very aware that when that's not the, you know, the fifth, if you're going to take a 10 minute break after the first hour, that is not the time to check your emails. That is not the time to do anything that's going to increase your cognitive load and distract you away from the task at hand because you want to remain in full focus when you're in flow. Um, and, and that's what you need to do. You also want to learn, and this is something that I was, I was getting, I, heard, I lost my train of thought a little bit, when I, but what I was gonna say is, the extraordinary thing about flow is it feels the same no matter what task you're doing. So when you're in flow playing a musical instrument, it feels the same as being in flow when you're really at one and everything's coming out writing your dissertation. And it feels the same as when you're climbing and it feels the same when you're surfing and it feels the same when you're having a really great conversation with someone and you're totally engaged with them. The flow state is the same. So you get to learn to recognize it and know it and it's, it's really worth learning how to get into flow. And it's really worth having kind of two, maybe even three activities that you do regularly that, that generate flow. So maybe you might get into flow in your work. I really hope you do. But also have some kind of hobby that generates flow as well. So you can get much more used to knowing what it feels like and what the different stages of the flow cycle feel like. Because if you can harness that and know it, you can start to do things like slightly back off before you're completely depleted. 
that allows you to get into recovery a little bit earlier so that you can then come around and do it all again. Because the very best top athletes and peak performers may only really get into flow twice a day maybe three times if they're really lucky if you're one of those people who is able to work in the evening as well you get up early you go through one flow state you have a break have some breakfast do your positive psychology exercises do your stretches a bit of yoga mindfulness etc that's uh, you're utilizing the recovery phase and then you go through it again it's very rare for someone to be able to do to do longer than two flow cycles and the average flow cycle maybe two three hours if you're really lucky but if you think about it most flow activities that are to do with sport what they're usually 90 minutes matches you know we pay a, we pay a fortune to watch people in flow we get we we love watching people at their best and when you watch those games at sport, it, it is usually 90 minutes maybe with a little bit of extra time and a, and a break in the middle so it often takes about a two hour window for a sportsman. And that's about as much as they can be at their best for. So you have to bear that in mind that productivity is not about being on fire from eight in the morning till six in the evening. Good product productivity is allowing yourself to be able to flow once, maybe twice in the day, and then using the other time of the day for, for on tasks that aren't that re, that are distracting that need to be done that, that are necessary but not they're productive in one way but they're not about getting the main work done so as i said like the afternoon can be dedicated to email responses all those kind of things that need to be done on a day-to-day -day task basis these are the known as the some of the flow triggers and if you look here, you know, um, uh, that's something I didn't talk about, actually. One of the, the things that defy, you'll know when you're in flow is you're getting immediate feedback. And what we mean by that is that we, you're getting immediate feedback that what you are doing is going well. So if you're playing a game of football, you kind of know that you're in the zone with it because everything is going right. Your passing is going well. Or if you're painting a picture, you know you're in flow because you're getting the immediate feedback straight away that, that this is going well the picture is coming to life when you're writing you know that your unconscious is sort of firing away really well and you're it's all just coming out and it's coming out and it's coming out i mean ayn rand talked about how she would you write then you edit and the writing part is the flow part and so if we think about that cycle i was saying earlier if you're writing Get yourself into flow and then use the afternoons to do your editing. So if we look here, intent, flow requires intense focused attention, clear goals that I was talking about. You need your goals for productivity to be really well defined. And sometimes we have to take our goals and we have to create sub goals and sub goals and sub goals and sub goals of that. We need to chunk the task something that's not written here but you really have to be aware of how much you can hold in mind as well so being productive is all about not going beyond one's um crow capacity or one the, not overtaxing your working memory so you have to know that you can only hold a certain amount of information in mind and that the sort of golden rule of that is five plus minus two parts of information so you want to anything that you're doing if the goals are or what you are trying to get done is too, if there's too many things there, you can't hold it all in mind and that really reduces your cognitive load. So again, you want to keep putting things out of your working memory and onto paper into, into your clear goal set. And that's why we, we keep breaking things down. And this is why you sometimes have to create goals within your goals, within your goals, so that you can hold those things in mind. You need immediate feedback. You need to set the appropriate challenge skills ratio that I was talking about earlier. So you do need to create an environment that is going to push you, that's going to challenge you if you want to be productive. And a lot of productivity comes from deadlines. 
so you want to work your your tasks around having having a you know a serious deadline that that pushes you because that raises your anxiety which focuses your mind that enables you to get into the task to be really there needs to be high consequences you know this thing has to really matter and that must come that that comes from your value system and your goal setting so there's the the flow cycle i've sort of given some pointers in in terms of productivity and how to utilize flow state to get into good productivity and i think maybe now it might be a good good chance to allow I'm, i know i've spoken quite fast today i might have said some things that have gone over people's heads i may have been a bit too technical so i was thinking maybe this might be a good time to allow people to ask any questions uh to clarify anything or add anything to what I've been talking about and uh, take it from there. Does that sound good, Nikos? Sounds good. And what you said really rings a bell in terms of, yes, this is what I, I experienced. So a, an example is this morning, so every other Saturday with some people from, from the Iron Run Center UK, we have like a reading group, something like we go through a particular program uh one of uh, Leonard Peikoff's actually modules and it's very intense really 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 intense and difficult and although last night I slept eight hours which for me is very unusual after this very intense intellectual intense session I felt really tired and I had another hour of nap in the in the afternoon and it reminded me something I saw in Joe Rogan so I don't remember with whom he was discussing it that sometimes chess players burn thousands of calories. I mean, I, I won't say the number of thousands because I was like, I can't believe that. Anyway, the guy said maybe 5,000 calories. I was like, that's impossible. But actually, it's what you say that when you are in this flow, it is the effort is many times higher than even the effort that you do when you do like, I don't know, 100 burpees or something. So definitely this is, it rings a bell. And the other thing that I wanted to kind of highlight on what you said. So yesterday, which was one of the days I used some of the techniques that you mentioned, A, it was super productive. B, that feeling at night, the feeling that this was a good and productive day, it gives you this almost a euphoria, which is why I thought I slept really, really good last night because it was a productive uh, day. But the question I have for you, actually I have many questions, but I'll start One thing I'll just say that what, yeah. what feels so good is, is the recovery phase is often the, the phase that feels the best of the flow cycle. When you're, at, when you're in flow, you're kind of, you, you know you're in it, you, you know you're in it, and it kind of doesn't feel of anything. It's, it's extraordinary. It doesn't re, you don't really feel much when you're in it, but it's the after phase, when you're in the recovery phase, like you're describing there, not only are you in a delta brainwave state, which is the really nice sort of meditative state that people get into when they, when they talk about getting into deep meditation, you're also getting a lot of serotonin and oxytocin released, which are some of the best feel-good chemicals there are. And that, that's the reward of almost the flow state. So that's, what, you know, that's why you feel that sort of super relaxed like you described and, and often you sleep really well and, and things like that. Yeah, and aiming who is in this kind of reading group says that he can feel his brain burning calories. So the, the first question I have for you, Josh, has yeah. to do with the sleep. And there's some mysteries for me in, in, in sleep. Right. One of my earliest learning experience memories comes from around 1992 or 91 or 92. And I remember, so this, is the, this was the first year when I was learning English. Yeah. And I remember, I still remember this feeling, waking up one morning, and the moment I wake up, it's like, I've learned the alphabet. So I was struggling to learn the alphabet for, let's say, a week. And at some point, I wake up one morning, it's like, maybe I dreamt of it or something. It's like, now I get it. Now I really, really get it. And these days, I have sometimes a similar feeling with, a, let's say, a particular submission in martial arts. It's not really a dream. I don't dream of the submissions. Like I've, I've, I've examined it the previous day. I've practiced it the previous day, but it's kind of a blur in my mind. And then I think about it at some point in my sleep 
or when I'm between sleep and half sleep, and then I wake up, it's like, now I get it. Now I see the whole mechanic, I see how it, how it works. And I've also quite often experienced, and I've asked people about them, they've experienced as well, that when they wake up in the morning, literally, they have their best ideas of the day. And I wish I had sometimes a notebook where I put down things I think literally when I wake up. So what is happening there? Is this, and what part of the flow process of the cycle is this? Or is this maybe like a placebo or just an idea? I don't think that that's not part of the flow cycle. Um, but often a lot of the best ideas come in the, in the recovery phase of the flow cycle. So what you could find is that maybe you've done, you've, you've done a lot the day before and then that's still part of your recovery phase when you wake up because the, the, when you wake up in the morning, you're in that alpha brainwave state, which isn't that far away from the delta brainwave state. So you're, you're kind of a bit more relaxed, etc., and it, it allows certain things to come to mind because when you're in a beta brainwave state, not many things come to your, your, much more sort of focused on task at hand and so lateral thinking and other other ways of sort of seeing things just aren't it's, it's less creative and so that that may be part of it but i'm not exactly sure so actually uh, david i'll come to your question but let's start with Amin because actually Amin claims he can somehow so he says this is a subconscious automation and he actually claims that he can plan for it to happen Amin, can you go live and, and give us a bit more of that? Because that's very interesting. So for the automatization, uh, the way I kind of plan for it is, um, and just to explain what I mean by it, is that um, any kind of skill, there's a, there's a, con there's a period of conscious learning, that, learning it, like you're learning to drive a car, learning to play an instrument, learning anything. And you have to, you're struggling because you're sort of thinking about all the different components of the thing and you're observing your, you know, your body, the motions. Um, and that's always a, a difficult thing. And, you know, any kind of practice of any skill that you don't currently have is like that. And what I plan for is that I know that if I keep focusing on that thing, sort of go do my practice routines, like almost blindly or, um, and for intellectual things, what I'll do is I'll just put, I'll just read stuff that I don't understand. I'll keep reading about the subject that I want to learn. And even if it doesn't all go in and I know that, and I don't, I don't know if this happens during your sleep or not, but I know the next day parts of it that didn't click the day before will click. And for me, that is a couple of things one of them is just obviously like you know muscle with, with driving a car it's muscle memory with practicing you know any kind of skill it's muscle memory and just familiarization and the other aspect of it which i'm not sure is um other people talk about is just i think that if you confront your brain with something that you think is important like you you consciously think is important over and over again eventually eventually i feel like my brain relents and says okay finally i will learn this thing like it's, it's resistant in the beginning because it's mm -hmm. thinking i can't be bothered like it, it's a lazy sort of machine that wants to do the minimum but if you if i keep showing if i keep banging my head against a wall against something especially an intellectual thing my brain will eventually start laying it in uh and i think that's i I, I, I put it under the same sort of category as automatizing. Same thing as like learning, um, learning to drive a car or whatever. And any idea why it happens in the morning when you, on I that would say it in between, the between sleep and waking up? I would say that it is, it is always something that happens the next day. It never happens the same day. I don't know if it's sleep or not. I don't know if it's sleep exactly or just taking a long break. I've never really tested this because this thing takes days. I think what it is is a huge amount of what of what you're talking about happens in REM sleep. That when you're in REM sleep, you filter REM sleep is what filters through so much of the learning of the day and throws out a lot of things that you don't need to know, and concrete um, brings things together. But it's exactly what you're saying there, I Eamon, mean, is what so many people report that like 
I really practice it's a clicking. Yeah. yeah, I really practice so much on Thursday and I practice and practice and practice trying to play a piece on the guitar. And then I slept and then I could play it for first thing on Friday. And people talk about this a lot uh, and notice this a lot with uh, physical training as well. You know, I was training with a couple of people in the park today and they were so much better on their first set today than they were two days ago because the body and the mind, everything needs to integrate kind of the, what you've done. And something I didn't talk about actually, but one of the most important precursors for getting to flow is what we call deliberate practice. And that's almost like what you were talking about here. Deliberate practice allows you to automatize. And when you automatize, you're able to get into that peak performance flow state much more easily. So when you, when you, when you practice all those scales on, the, on your musical instrument again and again and again and again and again, when you come to maybe doing some kind of improvising with some, some other musicians, all of that automized knowledge, musical knowledge, enables you to get into the flow state much more easily. So yeah, I think that, that was my, my second comment, which is flow is more about peak performance. So things are already automatized. I mean, that's the way I look at it. No, totally. That's totally correct. Can I ask something on this, both of you, please? I can understand how I can constantly practice a submission in, in martial arts. How can you constantly practice, let's say, understanding the objectivist theory of concepts? So how does this translate to intellectual endeavors? For me, like if I was going to answer that, um, it's what I said before, I keep throwing material at my brain and try to process it and try to think about it and try to connect it to, connect it to things. So right. the, you know how, I mean, I expect practice to be, I'm rubbish at the thing. So like when I'm playing, you know, guitar or whatever I'm doing, um, I expect it because I'm challenging myself. So I expect not to be good at the thing I'm doing when I'm practicing. And similarly with, with intellectual material, I try to go for the most complicated thing I can find. Something that is, a, something that is gonna challenge me. Um, and I expect not to really understand it. And I'll circle, th circle around this idea. I'll think about it, I'll mull it over. I'll, try, I'll have like conversations in my mind of like back and forth debating this thing. Um, and it's, I think a similar process happens where um, I'm, I'll wake up the next day and I understand the thing a lot better. And it, it, I think it's similar to, I, I'm guessing it's, it is also automatization. So if I were to like give an analogy, it's um, like as in connect what's the thing that's automatic. It, it would be if I think of a concept, I can immediately bring to mind all the implications, all the examples, everything sort of pops into my head and that's the, that's the automatic bit that the subconscious gives you. So like I think of any kind of complicated concept, I can immediately think of examples, uh, counter, you know, so arguments against arguments for the, the sort of all the implications. And that's the kind of thing that you don't have when you first come across a concept. Right. And I think that's the thing that actually allows you to understand the thing a lot better because you know all the ins and outs. That was very useful. Thanks. I'll, I'll, that's that's good, like food for thought and practice. Can I just um, answer something from the chat quickly to someone, David? Yes, we'll go to David's question and then we'll go to Elliot's raised hand. So the question is, can you explain again what the release phase is? So the release phase is really the sort of transition phase from struggle into flow. If, let's just take um, playing sport and you want to get into the zone with what you're playing. You're playing basketball and you come onto the court and it's one of those games where you, you're sort of coming on and you're, you're in the struggle phase, you're sussing out how good people are. You realize that people are pretty good. You realize that you're really going to have to be pushed here. You're, 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 you're having to focus. Um, you're, you're like, okay, I've got to get in the zone. You're, you're slightly anxious, but you realize that you can probably meet the task, but it's going to be difficult. Yeah. The, the release phase is when things just start to click you realize that you're not struggling anymore and you're, get, you're beginning to get into the zone. And it's this transition phase where you come out of being in a beta brainwave state and you move into an alpha brainwave state. But also what happens is when you go through the release phase, a lot of nitric oxide is released. And the nitric oxide not only um, enhances the ability to take in oxygen, but, but 
Nitric oxide also flushes out cortisol and norepinephrine from your system. So it takes away the stress of the situation. So the release phase is, is that movement into flow. And there's a few things that have to happen. The release of nitric oxide, the changing from being in a beta brainwave state to an alpha brainwave state. If you look on here in the flow state, look, look at the waves of a beta brainwave state, then alpha, you can see it's getting wider and wider as we move through. And the release phase is, you, the release phase is it just, you'll probably notice, hey, I'm getting into this now. This, is, this isn't so hard. I can do this. Those, are some, those would be some of the cognitions. You know, you're trying to write something and, and you know, you, you, you're like, you know you've been in flow because suddenly you've written five, six sides of A4 and you, you're like, where did that come from? But the release phase is like, you're, you, you sit down and you're, you're doing a, you're an exam. Remember at school, you had to do exams and you had to write an answer to a history test and you're like, the struggle phase is like, what am I all gonna get in order? What am I gonna say? And then you start to, you start to write it and then it, it just begins to start like, ah, oh, this isn't so hard now, I'm getting into this. That's the release phase and it's the release from struggle into flow. And I hope that answers the question. This clicks so, so much in, from personal experiences like, Last summer, I, I, I wrote a draft for my hopefully upcoming book on tribalism. And after the last two weeks and your two presentations, I realized that I was constantly on a struggle phase. Like yeah. I, didn't, I probably didn't even reach the... Because it was like, I'll just write 300 words and then I'll go back to Twitter. 300 words and I'll do something else. Because I had this goal... Like, I want to reach 1,000 words every day. Well, this means I write 200 and 200 and 200, which, so I was constantly in the struggle phase. And in retrospect, it was a really bad experience. And that's why the first draft was nowhere near where it, it could have been. So I wish, I wish we do this series, <laughs> we did this yeah. series last year. Okay, Elliot, you are unmuted. I was wondering whether or not there is a way of, say, reducing the stress of the um the sorry what was the first phase again I'm, it's the, struggle the struggle phase. phase yeah is there is there a way to reduce the stress of the struggle phase or yes. say reduce the time of the struggle phase or is it based on your skill and what you're trying to do you need to have the struggle mm. that's essential that you need you need because if you think in in that instead of the, the, what you're doing to, to get into flow is it has to be of high value to you so there has to be that like it's important to me i want to do this well i need to there has you know there has to be a lot of worth to that but you want to make sure that you are able to get through the struggle phase yeah so certain things that you need to have in place if you want to be productive you need to have slept well you need to be well nourished, you need to be hydrated, and you also need to be able to tolerate and not give up in struggle. So that's why I always say that a lot of these uh, mindfulness techniques are really essential. Like I talked a few weeks ago about box breathing. Well, box breathing teaches you to be, to be uh, more and more in an in a, in a uncomfortable state. But the more you are able to train yourself to be uncomfortable and resilient, the more easy it is to move through that struggle phase. I often think a lot about with surfing, yeah, is the struggle phase is, oh, Christ, okay, I've got to paddle out through that, those waves and get all the way out there. That's going to be really tiring and, and so on. I've trained myself to do things like um, just to keep going and paddling out at a steady pace and that I will get there and it will be difficult and I know that. That sort of slight distancing from that and experience allows me to know it's the same difficulty to get out there, but the way I've trained myself, the way I've, I've you know, to, to allow myself just to, okay, let's keep going. Just keep going, keep going. This is going to be difficult and it's going to burn, but the reward is going to be so good. Yeah. And, and that experience really helps. And there was, um, I can't, I can't give you the references right now, but there, is, um, there was a football team 
it was either college football team or something. They didn't have particularly great players, but they had an amazing coach. And, I, and, and it's, I'm glad you mentioned this because it reminds me to look back in my notes and stuff. But what he used to teach uh, his, uh, I was about to say clients, teach uh, the kids who are playing the sport is uh, when they were training, that if you, uh, the, the most important thing to do, let's say you're, you're, you're running and you hit a hill and you're learning to run, is always focus on your form. Always focus on your form and keep your form just right and keep going and it's going to burn and everything. But if you can keep your form and learn to keep that form correct, you'll have massive improvements. And that was basically the coach saying, I'm going to teach you how to get through the struggle phase. And I'm going to teach you a way of doing this is to actually keep where you focus, where you focus in your mind while you're struggling. I'm going to, I'm, what I'm going to do, and this, this ties into what would happen when I would try and when I would uh, have to paddle out to start surfing is it was more important for me to focus my mind on keeping my form well and keeping it a steady pace than you know, you, you this all the time in certain sports and activities that when people are struggling, they'll like, they'll go all out at something and completely tire themselves out. Whereas if you keep it a nice steady pace, often then you see this in long distance runners and stuff, they keep it a steady pace. And then they allow themselves to get through because they train themselves to go through that. So yeah, you, you need to train yourself to, to tolerate and be okay and struggle, not give up and not easily distract yourself with little mini boosts of dopamine, etc., to make yourself feel good. Or as you know, Nikos was saying, I'm just going to check my Twitter or I'm just going to check this or, because they, they, those little distractions can make you feel nice. But what you're doing is you're ruining moving through the struggle phase and a lot of people spend all day in that phase and it's, it's not very productive so mm -hmm. you, you have to learn and so you have to take responsibility for yourself being in the, the best possible shape to be able to move through struggle you know if you think about it, what, what what do soldiers do they get themselves into as much physical you know they get as physically fit as possible so that it's not as hard for them to do things Mm. Yeah, so that's what you need to do is you, you need to you need to learn to to tolerate struggle just for those who were not here in the last two weeks so yeah. could you give a couple of examples of what you mean by mindfulness exercises you mentioned box breathing anything else another great one is uh, so box breathing which you can just google it's easy, easy to do yeah but um resonant resonant or what's also known as coherent breathing you breathe in and out for five seconds ideally through your nose and it's called resonance breathing and it's six it's the six breath cycle in a minute it's six breaths per minute and what that does is okay five seconds in and five seconds out averages out to be probably the best amount of uh, the best breathing cycle for balancing your nervous system so what it does is when you breathe in you're triggering your sympathetic nervous system and when you're breathing out you're triggering your parasympathetic nervous system and by, by breathing and teaching yourself to breathe in for five seconds and out for five seconds and getting better and better and better at doing that, that balances the nervous system. It's also an optimal form of breathing for oxygen. In, um, and what you're doing, sorry, I'm, I'm, I noticed doing these things is when I do these talks at this time on the computer on a Saturday, I'm definitely not in my peak zone. And I noticed that my, I'm, I'm tired, you know, cognitively I'm, I'm tired and my vocabulary isn't so good. So that would be an example of struggle. I'm struggling a bit now. So I have to train myself to become better at working through these kind of times. And uh, often uh, something that, you know, to raise the challenge, for example, to get into flow, you want to raise, raise the challenge sometimes. When I'm doing talks, my favorite part is the Q&A because the Q and I, Q, during the q and I have to be sharper. I'm on my toes. I don't know what's coming. It raises the challenge. So there are certain things that we can all do to heighten all aspects of that flow cycle. And from experience, you can even practice going after experience that require, quote, struggle. So after your talk last like Saturday, on Sunday, I had the, to attend the webinar that usually doesn't help me be focused. So most of the time during the webinar, I do other things. 
this time I put it on, a ta on, on my schedule and the, the task was go through the two hours of the webinars without going anywhere else in your computer. So have your camera open so that you have to be committed there. It was the webinar that I enjoyed the most. So sometimes going after the struggle, conscious that this is it. So nothing can be worse than going through struggle and doing things that basically makes it a futile thing. Like you are there, but also you're not there. So basically it's a loss of time. So I found that consciously going through it would help. But let's go to Celia. You are unmuted. Yeah, just thank you so much. It's so helpful to like... I hate the word tips because it's too many at the moment, but just thanks, Josh. Just, um, just yeah, refreshing all this. And for me, just thinking about it, as you said, it's such a, wow, a time to reset all this. But I feel like I used to have, like, so much ability to focus. And now it's funny. I have so many less interruptions, as in I'm working from home, whereas I used to work in NHS in the most crowded, busiest office with loads of tangible interruptions and so now it's different interruptions so like notifications or my own anxieties but it it's really great to just have that sort of task almost set by you to say right this is the time now to just reset it all and yeah i just find at the moment just thinking of like a real construct it does feel like i'm spending all day in the struggle phase and just yeah it's really helpful to just think oh my gosh if i can just have that um, inspiration where we say well I just push through this you know and just to remember those times that I have had in the past or just a few glimmers of in the last you know couple of weeks where I have been able to focus on something and just that lovely feeling you know that you're not getting from the, the limited things we've got at the moment to help our dopamine hits you know yeah but thank you yeah so observations no questions let me emphasize on this observation like we are getting a lot of value from this uh, webinar Joe. so let me also add my voice to this and, and and what i found useful is at some point when i when i keep the notes from what you said then i've created the document in in this computer and i put these notes in some order because it's very easy to have this feeling of euphoria after the Joe seminar and then the <laughs> next day you forget everything so Putting things, putting things together is for me mm -hmm. what makes the difference between this effect being more sustainable and everlasting and, and long lasting, let's say. So I have had to make, I've been doing an online course, not, uh, I did, was doing the OAC, but I was also doing a, another online course. And what I was trying to do for a long time is I was trying to fit in the course before breakfast, that was my challenge. So I said, I, it would often was about half an hour a day. So I thought, okay, I'll do that before breakfast. Um, and after I've done a little bit of meditation and then I will use that time and I'll take it on board and blah, 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 and do the tasks involved. But I kept sort of trying to do my emails at the same time and trying to do a couple of other things. And I thought, oh, well, I don't need to fully focus on this right now. I can do this, that, the other. And I wasn't getting much value from it. And I, I had to tell myself, no, what you're going to do is you're going to put everything away and just fully focus on the course, on the lecture being given and, and the information there. And just be aware that the first 10 minutes is going to be a bit of a struggle. And in that time, that's the time when you might reach to your phone and, and tell yourself, or I would try and tell myself is, oh, no, you're doing something really productive at the same time. It's okay to check your Twitter because you actually, you are really interested in the news or, oh, it is important that I, I, I email this person back now, etc. But every time I did that, it was taking me away from the focus and the value I was getting from the course. And actually the truth of the matter is a lot of those emails and things and the news and everything could be done half an hour later. And it's also the rationalization yeah. that you give to yourself. So the reason I was going to Twitter every 20 minutes while I was writing the book is, oh, I'm writing a book on tribalism, so I need to check constantly the news for a new kind of tribal incident. Yeah. In retrospect, that was BS. That was me rationalizing my my, my, the fact that I, I would deny the need to go beyond the struggle phase. Totally. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's self-medicating or self-soothing, the struggle. And, rash, and I found myself, you know, oh, 
I would rationalize why I needed to email or, to, or, or WhatsApp back or whatever it was. But actually, when I really look at it, it's just not true. All those things could happen half an hour later. Celia, have you got a comeback specifically on this point? Thank you. About the multitasking and about, you know, whether we're doing it ourselves, you know. And then I just think, oh my gosh, it's so stressful. Like if I'm multitasking and when I've been, you know, welcome to a group like this, it's like, like, I just, it would just, it's such the incongruence somehow. Or when I've been in work and it's like a new setting and this other sort of multitasking that we're all, you know, I'm not saying I'm immune to it, but it just, it's been one of the most jarring things in the last few weeks with, you know, dear colleagues that I love. And then they're like, oh, they're not fully present, you know, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I just think it's really interesting in terms of, yeah, the struggle, the bigger struggle, the collective struggle and how we can be there present, you know, and it's so important, not just for ourselves to carry on, but, you know, for each other, you know, bit, and the respect. Sorry. I think I've heard the term about that. Uh, it's something like productive procrastination or something. So you multitask because you want to avoid the task in hand and you think you're doing something which is productive, but actually you are not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, At least that's yeah. what I've caught myself doing. Like, yeah. oh, I need to read one more book before I write this section. In terms of productivity, this is one of the, the big issues that a lot of mistakes that a lot of people make is let's say that you are in a business and, and the, the business will be most successful if you make more sales. So actually your time, your most productive time should be sent, spent on selling. But the amount of people who say, yeah, I'm going to get to the selling, but I just need to make sure that the logo is done. And I need to make sure that the website's finished. And I need to make sure that, and so on and so on and so on. And all these things are, you know, sound good and, and important, but they're actually not that important or they're not as important. So you need to get a sort of hierarchy. It's like a values hierarchy within the, the productivity task at, at, at hand. And this is a big mistake that a lot of people make with productivity is that they, they say, um, oh yeah, I've got to do this and I've got to do this and I've got to do this and I've got to do this, but they never actually spent time prioritizing which are the most important parts of that chain. And as well, so you're using it to procrastinate, you're using it to distract. And there's also just the fact that attention and focus hasn't been put on what are the most important parts of this. And that's a, a big, a huge mistake people make. So we go to Betty and then we go to Amin's comment and then to Joseph. Betty, you are unmuted. Thank you for the talk, Josh. It's a lot of information. It's very useful. I was just wondering when you said um, about the keeping form, when you're in the struggle phase, do you mean focus on what you're doing? Yeah. As in be mindful about what you're actually doing in that actual present moment. Absolutely. I mean, so for example, with the, with the athletes, it's to keep your form as in keep, you know, like if you're, I don't know, doing squats or whatever it is, focus on your form, focus on your form, keep yourself going like that. Yeah. It's, it's about being mindful and, and, and knowing that, keep going with that okay thank you thanks baby so uh, aiming before i go to joseph because it looks like aiming's comment is related to the previous part so letting small bad things happen in order to focus on the big task is a useful idea that uh, he learned from tim ferris tim ferris is really good actually by the way in, in product design good to cut procrastinating on distractions ask if only if i only did one thing today and do that yeah so yeah that's that's basically also related to to what joe said about this hierarchy of what is the most important thing yeah. that that needs to be done right joseph unmute yourself uh, so it's really a comment because you were uh, discussing about prioritization of tasks how you can get um caught up in small tasks uh, yeah. I found a really good book there is one called Critical Chain by Goldratt Na uh, Netanyahu or something. Goldratt is called Goldratt uh, because that one is, is making it so crystal clear that you cannot really avoid those important tasks because it's like a, a set of tasks along a line. And if you delay one of those that is critical, then everything else is going to delay. So you really have to prioritize those um, high priority tasks. Thanks, John. Yep. So can I also ask 
another question related to that, and then I want to ask a question related to the stimulation phase, but in between people, feel free to raise your hands. So could you be in flow when you do boring stuff? So if I have to do, like, if I have to do things like emails or sometimes editing students' drafts, I find it almost impossible to get in flow. So the best I can expect is put some background music and be in this kind of in and out mental kind of focus. And that's as good as it gets because it's not in the, actually in the, in the, in the uh, challenge and how comfortable you are, it's very low. The challenge is relatively low and I've done this a million times. So can you be in flow? I, although I guess I, this kind of answers the question. So can you be in flow when you do stuff, which is basically the stuff that like the bureaucratic managerial stuff that you have to go through throughout the day? So um, what, when you're doing tedious tasks like that, you need to go to the challenge skills. You need to remember the challenge skills ratio. So what you need to do is increase the challenge and if you increase the challenge that focuses the mind and flow follows focus so if we think about it so can you do this in answering emails for example yes you can so what you could do for example is you could uh give yourself a half an hour window and i've got to answer all my emails in that half an hour and that could uh, really focus and that could raise the challenge it could focus the mind it could give it could adrenalize you and then you may have to come up with some creative solutions when you do that and boom you've done it there's a great section in chick sent uh book on flow where he talks about there's a an, he uses an example of the happiest man in a detroit factory oh he's, yeah 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 he's on the assembly line and that guy is able to set it up because he sets himself some uh some goals you know he increases the uh challenge skills ratio for himself so that he can always get himself into flow. So you might give yourself a minute, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer everyone at this time with this time period. And that, that might be a struggle for me to do, but then that struggle and difficulty of that situation raises the challenge. My abilities meet that challenge. It's no longer boring or relaxing. It, I can maybe get into flow or at least be in control. Very good point. Yeah, I never thought of it this way. Good yeah. point. Yeah. So let's go to the user whose Someone name else. don't know because it's iPhone, but you are unmuted. So my, my question would be that like, whether or not the topic that we are discussing today, like, you know, the idea of flow, productivity can be also like apply or is relevant in terms of like public speaking. Uh, in the sense, like not necessarily giving a speech to, like you know, in public space or to a huge crowd, but for instance, just like in teams meeting or even like in a meet up situation, like now, if naturally someone, like, I mean, perhaps like me, who is kind of like naturally struggle or kind of get anxious about having to say something, or having not to say something, or having to give opinion about something, and if this kind of situation can then actually then inform like you know what will be what needs to be done for the entire work week or for the work day like that how 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 does the idea of flow i mean struggle phase and release flow and recovery might be relevant to this kind of context or challenge or whether this is kind of out of the you know the topic so basically you mean when you have to do something which is difficult and you know you will struggle as for example do public speaking in particular, like whereby it's a bit more like unpredictable what will be discussed and you don't know what people's response would be, like how the discussion point might be diverted to certain direction and whereby your material, I mean, like, let's say you're giving a presentation, no? like whereby your presentation may be misread by people or maybe you are not fully prepared, whereby your thought is constantly maybe disturbed by the Q&A and then I don't know whether that is relevant to, to the topic of productivity and flow. I think it makes sense in the terms that I think Josh talked also about feedback. And sometimes this feedback is not very relevant. Like if you shoot a basketball, you know if the ball, goal, ball goes in. 
So yeah, I think the, I, the question makes sense and it's interesting. Josh, do you wanna jump in it? No, I think, I think <laughs> what you're saying that's right, Nikos. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that if the struggle is too much, we fail and we can never get around the flow cycle. So you, you do have to have an awareness of, of what your capacity is there in terms of skills challenge ratio. Now, if you're talking about, uh, say, public speaking and not being, one of the, one of the things about get, being able to get into flow is you need to have done lots of deliberate practice. You need to have automatized a lot of tasks to be able to get into flow. So it, it may be, if we go back thing here, if your abilities aren't high enough, you may just find yourself in, a, in anxiety or maybe at best in the arousal phase. So you, you, have, to, you have to be very aware of, of the challenge and your abilities in the context of that. Now, the, the, a lot of the research into flow and where, where, where it lies on this, on this chart is they find, they find that it's about 4% above your top capability is what will get you into maximum flow and anything above this. And they found this from um, studying a lot of the great flow research started in the 1990s. And what was also going on in the 1990s was the huge expansion of um, extreme sports. And they were able to see people where each, you know, almost, almost weekly pushing all the boundaries of what was, what was capable, what was possible. And from that, they're able to extrapolate that people when they're doing a lot of uh, training and pushing themselves, that about four or five percent above your top ability is what gets you into flow the most. But to answer your question in terms of that, there are there are parts of that that are they're relevant. It, but you really have to know yourself. You really have to know what your skills and 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 what your training and everything. I think um, yeah. Thanks for your explanation. I think like um, I, I guess I was referring to the work situation. I suppose. Like um, like um, they they are multi dimension to to certain job. For instance, sometimes it's about producing the work, but sometimes it's also about presenting it to people in relatively short term of like time frame. And you're right to say that like um, it it kind of refer back to the chart of ability and challenges. It is about practicing in order to you know to to maybe like maybe it's about practicing it by reducing it uh, or, or adjusting the challenge to a certain degree and slowly measuring up your ability exactly. and in order to, 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 you know, to be more prepared for the challenge. But quite often, I mean, let's say, you know, in a presentation on a meeting, the, the challenge uh, will be there, but it's not something that you can measure. Yeah. So, but it's about practicing in advance and, and see how you might be able to, you know, to improve or increase your capacity. Public speaking is, is a really good example. I mean, I, I do a fair bit of public speaking now. And uh, talks that I used to be nervous and anxious to do, now I'm not, ner because I've done them a lot of times, I'm not so nervous and anxious to do them. I'm less likely to get into flow with them unless I, I start changing the, the challenge of it. So maybe reducing the notes or... Um, and so on, and that's why I say particularly why I particularly enjoy the Q and A because that really pushes me a lot of the time. And uh, you know, if I was to do a talk at, at, at Ocon, for example, right now, I don't think I'd be prepared enough. So I don't think I would be able to get into flow and be very good in the Q and A. But if I did a certain amount of preparation and etc., I would be able to meet that task. So. There's a huge amount of personal responsibility here and, and a lot of prep work. And that's why we often need to have clear goals. Mm. Yeah, as we're saying, we need to have those clear goals in place. And I think you kind of answered your question just now, actually, Betty. I, I think what you were just saying there about preparation is key. I think um, I'm using your answer to clarify my thoughts. So that was useful, yeah. Pre yeah. Practicing, yeah, preparation. Deliberate practice. Deliberate practice results in effortless effort. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And just to mention to our friend who just asked the question that at some point, at some, not sure when, we're going to have a whole workshop on public speaking. Uh, the speaker is not, uh, we, we, Raz is going to let you know soon. So here's a question that I, by mistake, came, came to me as a private message, but actually it's a question for, for, for Josh. So the question is, I usually go to the gym 
and realize that when I try to focus on my phone, I end up zapping my energy and performing below my target. Is this part of flow? If I can jump in this, because I've, I've... I'm not sure I understood the, the question. I think that the, the part about the flow means is a process of workout a flow? And at least for me, it definitely is. One way it can get ruined is with Spotify and no, that's not the song I like. Oh, and no, that's this annoying kind of ad. Yeah. So although there's all this research that says that music can boost your maximum rep, if you're, I have found that quite often music while working out takes me away from the, from the zone, so to speak, because the term I use in working out is the zone. Yeah. And it, the music can get you in the zone, but when you, you have to do it like that, it can also have the opposite effect. Well, that distracts focus. That's yeah. the thing, you need, you need to focus. So the, the, one of the things they often say, music uh, is great for flow if, as long as it doesn't have words in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So often like you want to set up um, certain kind of playlists that are instrumental and you know that, again, it all comes down to the, the preparation phase. Have I created a playlist that's not going to annoy me or distract me? Have I set up a playlist that's going to um, be aware of the struggle phase, the release phase, the flow phase and the recovery phase? Felix, you're unmuted. Felix has a follow up. I think what I meant, I got a bit confused, what I meant by that part of the struggle phase, because of um, I'm, I'm hearing that you have to keep pushing past the struggle phase and keep going, keep going. Is that part of the Oh, yeah, phase? so it's part of the struggle, not of the flow. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah um, because of I tend to, you know, like I do get the feelings of, oh, you know, putting so much pressure on myself, oh, I'm not going to be able to do it, I'm going to still take myself to the gym anyway. But then when I'm there, I focus so much on getting the form right, getting the form right. And then I do it, but just not enough um, uh, reps. And this sort of like my morale goes low and so, you know, uh, affects my performance sort of thing. I mean, Jim, Jim is a great example of the challenge skills ratio in, in, in effect that, you know, you, you have to, you go to the, you go to, I mean, currently at the moment, I'm going to the park and I'm, um, working out with two friends and they're way behind me and so i'm sort of training them unofficially and even even in two weeks you know i'm increasing the, the uh challenge for them so that they're getting the same result because i'm seeing them adapt and and get into it so they always have to keep making it harder and harder and harder thank you so <laughs> betty asks how can i resist the temptation to watch another cut video, dopamine hit. So one, one, one way to help you with this is to realize what, what you're actually doing there. What you're doing is you're, you're interrupting the struggle phase. And then what you're doing is you're just resetting yourself back to the beginning of the, of the struggle phase. You're creating a vicious cycle. So every time I have a dopamine hit, that's just putting me back to step one. It, when you're in the struggle phase. No, no. If you're, if you're using these external things to break the struggle and often we use the things we reach out to are things that are going to give us a little hit a little like to make us feel good and then we can uh, get back to the struggle what we're doing is we keep resetting the struggle phase but if you just say to yourself hold on a sec this is what i do now it's like hold on a sec i don't need to check my phone because that's just going to interrupt the struggle and i need to go through the struggle and when, when you realize that and it's made more conscious, it's a lot easier to manage the struggle. I should resist the temptation to reach for another cupcake or watch another cat video. It's not good for me in the long run. In the context of what we're talking about here, productivity and flow, you know, make, reach, reach for the, the um, cat video and the cupcake when you're in the recovery phase. Have it as a reward. Have it as the reward, yeah. But don't use it to interrupt uh, the struggle phase because then you're never going to get into flow yeah just sit with it yeah acknowledge it acknowledge it yeah mm. for what it is as, as a crucial element of productivity not something to it's it's not something to be uh dismissed or erased it's something to be like hey this is part of the cycle thank you okay i'll ask the last question uh, it's between the relationship between flow and uh, arousal 
So I find myself quite often, the best experiences in life are experiences at the level of arousal, but also for me, periods of arousal, because arousal is usually a period for me, it's something that I've got like something new in my life. Sometimes when you fall in love, there's a nice scene in Atlas Shrugged in part three where Dagny says, I don't think I'll ever sleep again. And I think there's also in Romeo and Juliet, something like Juliet says, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'll never sleep again or stuff like that. Yeah. But also the periods of arousal are really, really bad for my sleep, really bad. Like I can sleep and then I wake up after like five hours and it's impossible to, to sleep again. So, and sometimes we say these, these artists, you know, write these masterpieces when they're in a delirium situation, which it's not clear to me whether it is arousal, a period, a arousal or flow. It's flow. The yeah, question yeah. then is, is a sexual experience uh, because it kind of feels like you're, if it's good, that it's this flow. Is this flow or arousal? Flow, sex has some of the characteristics of flow, but not all of them. If you look at the, the, the cycle, so um, is it effortless effort? Kind of, but kind of not. You know, and, and I, I was talking about this it, it, when I was doing one of the flow trainings in Seattle. I said, it's funny no one mentions sex, because uh, they often do. And, um, and Stephen Kotler was just saying to me, yeah, he said that people confuse that just because something can have aspects of a process, it doesn't mean that it's fully is. So there are aspects of, of um, sex that you could say were flowy, like you feel at one with what you're doing, time dilation, those sorts of things. But then there's other elements of it where are you performing at your best? Is learning going through the roof? Are you fully focused or are you kind of losing your focus in some ways with sex and so on? It's, 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 a, it's a strange one because it, as I said, it, it's quite flowy, but it's not, um, it's not the same. And also flow feels the same almost in what you're doing and sex doesn't feel like flow. When I'm in the zone, when I'm in the zone writing or when I'm in the zone um, surfing or when I'm in the zone exercising or when I'm in the zone listening to a great piece of music, it basically feels the same. And it doesn't feel like sex. There are elements of, of uh, sex that are flowy. Right. And I think it's also mentioned by the author of Flow, which I can never pronounce that. Chick sent me high. Your best times of life are not times while you're into Flow. So it doesn't mean that Flow is like the best that life can get. But anyway, that's... The studies show that, that uh, the happiest people, and we have to be careful of how we define happy, but um, although those people are flourishing the most, have a lot of, have an enormous amount of flow in their life flourishing people but they also have a real purpose and meaning in their life yeah they have and they have a, a, a value a code of values and this is what you know this is why the objectivist ethics is is so powerful because it it ties in all the positive psychology the best of the positive psychology research and discoveries completely uh line up with the, the objectives, ethics, hierarchy, values, the importance of goal setting, the importance of self-esteem, and so on. And that's really, it's really powerful stuff. But so flow is an essential part of a flourishing life, but it's not the only part. And let's end with this comment, which says we need maybe more deliberate practice. I would say not only in sex, but in whatever is fulfilling. So in that happy note, let me say and for one more time, many thanks to, to Josh for doing this. We, all of us are getting tremendous value out of it, and, uh, or at least I get tremendous value out of it. And from the questions, I also think that people get a lot of value of it, out of it. So thank you very much. Keep an eye in Ayn Rand Sanders UK Twitter and YouTube channel for the recordings of these events and for announcements about future events so till next week all the best and thanks to josh and thanks for thanks to everyone for being here